The phrase light in winter is almost a contradiction in terms in Ithaca, New York. The weather tends to be gray. The colleges, which generate most of the activity around here, are on break. That began to change in 2004 with the first Light in Winter Festival. Barbara Mink, a senior lecturer at the Johnson Graduate School of Management at Cornell University, was one of the organizers of the Light in Winter Festival. And Barbara, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Claudia. I tend to think of Light in Winter as another almost contradiction in terms. It's an unlikely pairing of art and science. Is that a fair characterization? It is, and that's really the um, impetus for the whole festival. Uh, it, the thought started in 1999. Um, I was chair of the county board at the time and involved in creating the new tourism program. And we had done a study on something called edutourism, which is providing an experience for visitors where they actually learn something. And Ithaca seemed like the perfect place to start an edutourism initiative because to me, um, Cornell and Ithaca College and TC3 were natural resources just the way the gorges and the lake are. And the art and science coupling, how did that come about? Well, uh, a really brief history. When we first started thinking about this and holding meetings every two weeks, it was 1999, and the idea was um, an arts festival during the summer, and it was going to be called Harmony in Nature. Uh, along the way, one of our board members, who used to be the head of the concert series here, Dick Riley, suggested that we try to incorporate popular science in the mix. Um, we discussed whether we should have lectures and then concerts, but we decided to try to put them together and to create new collaborations. And that was something unique, and that finally evolved into Light in Winter. Who were some of the other major players back then? Oh. Uh, the best and the brightest minds in science and especially music in the community. Uh, Tom Eisner, Ron Hoy, um, Roald Hoffman. Uh, we, Dick Riley suggested that I contact Paul Winter, the uh, very well-known musician who does a winter solstice concert every year at St. John the Divine and who has incorporated animal sounds in his music. And he came for an organizational meeting. Dale Corson was very involved uh, in the beginning. Um, Hunter uh, Rawlings was very supportive. Uh, every, actually, Cornell administration has been very supportive from the beginning. And in terms of music, Reed Gainsford from Ithaca College, the Ariadne Quartet, Steve Stuckey. So a lot of people kept coming to meetings and the idea kept getting refined. And that was the most important thing to actually get it off the ground, was to have a clear vision and what made it special and unique not only in the community, but in the country. Apart from the edutourism aspect of it, what was the goal in the beginning? What were you hoping to achieve? One of the goals was to make this an event that would attract people from outside of Tompkins County to come and visit. And that was a holdover from part of the goals of um, developing tourism as a Tompkins County economic development tool. Another goal was really to um, give people here the sense that they may have met their neighbor in the bagel shop, but they didn't know he was a Nobel Prize winning chemist and poet. Or they may have run into a wonderful piano player down the street, but never knew what he could do. And that was one of the results from the first year. Um, at, at the time, we put it together uh, largely volunteer, though we raised money to pay production people and so on. And it debuted all around the county, the Museum of the Earth, uh, Cornell, Ithaca College, uh, the Science Center. And it was 12 degrees, and people were rushing from one place to another, the Lab of Ornithology. And you could never get from one place to another in time, so everything was always late. But the final, the reaction was amazement by people who uh, met their neighbors for the first time and realized what a rich community we live in. At what point was it decided to have it in the winter? It poses its own problems in Ithaca. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, there were two prime uh, factors there. One was a total rejection of funding by the county for anything in the summer because we already have hotel rooms filled. And so they were not interested in that sort of thing. Uh, I held out a, having something in the winter because it's hard to travel, people are busy and so on. But after 9-11 in 2001, 
a lot of things changed. We lost a lot of um, university representatives, the ability to raise money, and I was ready to just call it a day. But the um, tourism board was very interested in getting something in the winter, and I thought having it on the cusp of the semesters, when the break is done and when, before the semester begins, might be a good time. Also, at that time, in 2003, 2004, uh, there really was nothing happening in Ithaca. Uh, this was before the State Theater was revived to its great success now, uh, before the Kitchen Theater was really year-round. So there was a gaping hole in what there was to do. And so this was a light in that winter. Did you have any models for light and winter when you went into it? Was there anything else like it happening? No, there's nothing like it in terms of a festival, but there were two influences, very strong influences. One was uh, something called Entertaining Science, which Roald Hoffman uh, was putting on at the Cornelia Street Cafe. And it's closest to what we now experience as the science cabaret here. He would put together someone from uh, some field of science and someone from the arts, somewhat related, and see what happened. Uh, informal, fun, low expectations, terrific value. Uh, another influence was the art and science program at the City University of New York. Um, they put on a series of NSF-funded programs where artists and scientists often collaborate, or a scientist will provide gloss on a movie and, and so on. And that's uh, held in a, a series of open lectures, not in a festival. But in terms of an art and science festival, no, there was nothing like that. Were there any other challenges besides the weather for that first light and winter? Well, the challenge of money is always a challenge. Uh, it's hard to go after a certain point on just adrenaline and volunteer effort. So raising money took about four years, uh, and then it's been a, a, a yearly uh, struggle. but certainly getting the support and just the logistical complications. Um, one of the nice things about it, one of the things I felt best about, was that it was the first official um, alliance among Cornell, Ithaca College, and the community for something that was not started at either one of the campuses, but really just grown from the ground up. And that was a, that was a good thing and worth, worth continuing. Thinking back to 2004, can you describe that first light and winter? Who was involved and, and who performed and Gosh. lectured? Well, let's see. Um, Emily Goldman, my daughter, was a, uh, is a concert pianist, and she performed something with Ron Hoy, who was an expert on bird and insect sound. And they did something at the Lab of Ornithology called Birdsong in Messiaen. The French composer Olivier Messiaen would transcribe bird songs as he heard them and created very difficult, interesting piano pieces. Ron Hoy explained how birds produce the sounds that they do. Emily explained how Messian transcribed and created the sounds that he produced. And it was a wonderful little blend of, of science and art. Um, Tom Eisner, Sarah Smolin, the cellist. Tom Eisner is the great entomologist. Uh, Sarah Smolin, the cellist. Loretta Room, a poet, did something on insect sounds where, Loretta, uh, where uh, Sarah improvised on her cello to the sound of insect voices, and Tom gave the, his wonderful photographs of close-ups of insects. And uh, Reed Gainsford and a trio collaborated with Chris Clark from the Lab of O on whale song, and they did a George Crumb piece, Song of the Whale, um, under the skeleton of the right whale in the Museum of the Earth. And so that, and Chris Clark talked about how whale songs were produced, so that was thrilling. Uh, also, that year, we had Paul Winter come and give our first big concert at the state. And we put him together with Roger Payne, who was the discoverer of the Song of the Humpback Whale, one of the discoverers, along with his wife, Katie Payne. And they did a show on uh, whale songs and animal songs. Katie Payne, who has now made a world reputation as an, elef uh, an elephant communication expert, performed with uh, Mamadou Diabate and Samite in a piece we called Winter in Africa. So it was kind of a, a magical feeling because nothing like that had ever been done before. And it was all over. And it was cold. And at that time, your role was artistic director? Well, pretty much. Has that evolved? Everything. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. 
How has your um, how has Light and Winter evolved over the years? It's become an organization. Um, now I am the artistic director, and I have a, a wonderful partner, Marie Sorakis, who's the executive director. And roles have been changing uh, all along. At first, I was the president of the board, so that separated. So it became a real nonprofit organization with different roles. Um, the attempt to create something new and different, but still keep to the mission of Light and Winter is a challenge every year. So uh, where first we really featured local uh, scientists, artists, and musicians, I've, we started bringing in a lot of people from outside, many people who do this sort of thing as part of their life's mission. Uh, so this year, for example, we'll have Lawrence Krauss, who was the one of the first popularizers of popular science, who wrote the physics of Star Trek. And he is going to come from, beam in from the West. Really? Beam in? He's beaming in, yeah. On a plane, yes. How, <laughs> how do you conceptualize each year's light and winter? How, how does it come together? Mm. Well, it's, it's, for me, it's year-round reading and calling. Uh, I contact about 20 more people uh, than who actually say yes. Uh, a lot of it is reading what's going on in terms of new scientific discoveries, uh, interesting art science in literature and plays. Uh, and if there's an interesting idea, I try to think of the people who could work together to bring it into some sort of interesting collaboration. Um, people will never go to light and winter and then come out really understanding the more difficult concepts in math and science that we provide. But they will have their eyes open to something they may not have thought about before. And one of the fun things about especially putting music together with science is that it provides a different point of entry for people. Um, there was one example where a composer from Indiana, I knew through the music department here, had written a piece for computer and three instruments that to him represented the sound of uh, molecular movement, atoms bouncing and so on. It was a really lovely piece. So we had local performers do it and the composer came and that was in conjunction with a presentation by the uh, multiverse physicist Lisa Randall who came uh, down from Harvard. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of a, a gloss one on another. Mm -hmm. Neither one explained the other, but it was just a different point of entry. Is there a meeting where everybody sits around and brainstorms and, and talks? Well, I have a wonderful program committee, and a lot of people come up with great ideas. And mm -hmm. then it's my, my job to follow through and make it happen. Uh, we get great suggestions from the community. Every time there's a festival, people will write emails. How about this? How about this? People send me links and ideas. I followed many of them. How can people contribute ideas before I? Oh, they can contact me. I'm right you can, through the Light and Winter website, lightandwinter.com, or I'm on the web and other capacities. Always write. I'm always happy to get them. What do you think the impact of Light and Winter has been on the Ithaca community? I, I think it has had an impact in terms of. Uh, people looking forward to a time of year that they used to just go to bed for. Um, I've heard that a lot of organizations around town now plan their schedules so as not to conflict with light and winter. Uh, I had a lovely note from a woman once who said that she and her mother were not doing Christmas this year. They're using their money to go to, to light and winter afterwards. Uh, so that kind of uh, liberation of the spirit and the mind, I think, is a legacy. That people can come and, and it's mainly adult oriented. We have a Hall of Wonders which is aimed at, at uh, younger kids, but it's always been for the adults who were absent that day, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, those of us who never got a chance to study things that we didn't think we could get. And it's just a, a way to touch base with that feeling. Do you think it's had any impact outside of Ithaca? Oh, I, I think it has. Uh, we're now the mem uh, a member of what's called the Science Festival Alliance, and we're the only art and science festival in that group. But in the early days, um, the physicist Brian Green, who had just left Cornell for Columbia, uh, was a good source of ideas. 
and I had met with him a few times, and we had talked about being in Light and Winter. After 2001, uh, I let him know that we probably wouldn't have enough money to pay him, so it kind of got off to the side. But Brian emerged with the World Science Festival in New York uh, three years ago, uh, which featured many of the same programs that we had, different players, different locations. Um, but that was one legacy, and uh, a lot of people contact us for ideas on what they can do. How do you see light and winter evolving going forward? I don't know. Uh, we live in perilous times economically, uh, and though people love the idea of light and winter and the reality of it, we'll have to see if it continues in its present form or if it changes to be more of a science festival. Or I don't know. We'll have to see. What are you, some of your favorite aspects of the festival that you would like to see perpetuate? Well, I love the community aspect. I love the fact that there is actually a solid light and winter community. I mean, there are scores of people who have come to every performance of every year since the beginning. And then there are always new people. So the number of bodies increase, but it, it's a kind of a rotating thing. So it becomes a light and winter community bringing people together. I love that. As somebody who uh, had come here to go to Cornell, who then worked downtown and now has been teaching at Cornell for 25 years, uh, I like that unification. After doing this for so many years, could you write a book about running a festival? I'd have to think about that. I don't think it would be a book. I think it would be a pamphlet. I think there would be lessons learned. Uh, probably yes. If you did write that book, what components would you say uh, to a reader are essential for the mm. success of, a, of an undertaking like this? Yeah, uh, certainly an open mind, both to what's going on in terms of ideas. Uh, somebody who starts something like this has to be uh, in a network in the community to know who to call to do what. At least I found that, that helpful. Uh, has to have a vision for what it can be the first year and what it could grow to become. And what advice would you give to anybody who's contemplating taking on something like Light and Winter? Hmm. Well, see what's being done in your community first and make partnerships. Uh, that's the way to build it. That's not only the way to build on what people are already doing, and most of the time we're not even aware of all the wonderful things that other people are doing, but it also builds interest in the community, and you need that. You need a, a solid community support if you're thinking about doing a tourist-oriented thing. It has to be loved in the community first. Barbara, thank you. Thank you. I've been talking to Barbara Mink, a senior lecturer at the Johnson Graduate School of Management at Cornell University, about the Light and Winter Festival. I'm Claudia Wheatley. Thanks for watching.